physics dedicated to the explication of what are called theories of everything from a theoretical physics perspective, but as well as outlining the possible connection consciousness has to the fundamental laws of nature, provided those laws exist at all and are knowable to us. Kurt J. Mungle also happens to be myself, as this is an Ask Me Anything that was recorded live on October 27th, 2021. Thank you and enjoy this Ask Me Anything with Kurt Jaimungle. If you can see this type Art Vandalay, Art Vandalay. Okay, if you can see this, type itchy and scratchy. Itchy and scratchy. All right. Okay. So there are quite a few questions. I think there are approximately 130 or so. So if I seem glib and or curt, then, well, I have to be in order to get through these. Okay. Hello, everyone. Thank you. Hi. So six pool six i x pool asks, Kurt, which toe is your favorite so far? I like Wolfram box take. I like Wolfram's and box take personally, and was curious what your thoughts are on those in particular. Mm, now for me, some people say it's like choosing babies. Which one is your favorite? But that would imply that I have an attachment to them, and they don't have an attachment to any particular toe. It's more like asking me which Renaissance painting is my favorite. I don't know enough about Renaissance paintings in order to have some favorite. I don't have a criteria to compare them. I don't have some integrated worldview that would necessarily need to be there in order for me to see the connections between the two or make some criteria. Now for Bach, I don't understand what he means precisely by simulation. So I... I don't understand why such a process would entail an experiential element. For Wolfram, I understand Wolfram. Wolfram speaks my language. As for which one's my favorite, again, I don't have a I don't have a favorite. I have some that I like and dislike, but it's difficult for me to disentangle the theory from the person proposing the theory. Here's an example. I recently spoke to Carlo Rovelli. I happen to like Carlo Rovelli plenty because of our relationship once we spoke. Same with Ian McGilchrist. So I know that unconsciously I'll ascribe them more positive points than I would if I didn't get along with the person. And I'm extremely careful about making statements about which toe, which toe I like and dislike because of that reason. I don't take it lightly. Okay, Mark N says, do you now consider yourself a non-dualist? Is this a concept you've worked with for a while? Has one of your guests convinced you or brought you closer to this? I'm not a non-dualist, and I don't think you can claim to be a non-dualist if you actually were one, because to say it with words implies the opposite of non-dualism. So in either sense, I'm not a non-dualist. Sismon Stro... Apologies if I don't read your name correctly. Sismon asks, Kurt, I subscribed to your channel immediately after watching the Hoffman episode. Cool. When are you going to interview Hoffman again? Whenever he's ready. Abir Majumder says, Hey Kurt, I want to ask. See, some of these questions aren't written. I have a difficult time parsing. Parsing what's written if it's not written exactly grammatically correctly because I skim quite quickly. And then if it. And then if it doesn't cohere, I have to keep going back to the beginning. Hey, Kurt, I want to ask, what are researching on or want to research in the future? So, Kurt, I want to ask, what are you researching and what would you like to research in the future? How do you research your guest, number two? And how long does it take to research about a guest? Three, what are your views? So there's quite a few questions here. What are your views on ethics? Four, how do you take biotechnology? Okay, I'm not going to answer that. Five, what are your views on happiness and well-being? Six, how do you find peace and chaos? And lastly, how do you chill? Thanks for these amazing interviews and your love for us. Well, as for researching, I just watch lectures. I go through someone's Google Scholar page, if they're a scholar, and I sort by most cited and then most recent. And I look at a few of those. I don't print them, 
I usually read digitally. I don't have a view on ethics. I think it's a secular and at times cowardly way of saying morality without making an appeal to morality because people have godophobia. They're afraid to invoke the usage of God or objective morality. And people like to appear to be enlightened, rational people. Or more specifically, they like to not appear to be like those backward religious people. And by religious, they tend to mean a straw man of what religious is. Okay, as for happiness, happiness is a wonderful state. It's a wonderful, wondrous state. That's my view on it. As for peace and chaos, I don't, I luckily don't have much chaos in my life. I also wouldn't say that I have a great deal of peace unless I'm with my wife or I'm driving. I like long drives alone. I enjoy much of my day, almost each minute, except if I have to edit, which I so despise video editing. And they often take half of the day if I have to, more than half of the day. For example, Leo Gura took two days. As for chilling, I don't chill much. I'm not a chill person per se. If I chill, it's with my brother. We have what we call bro dinners. And those sometimes get philosophical, though in an unfurled manner. And I also enjoy spending time with my wife. I look forward to playing video games again. And I just... Man, I'm... I am... Well, I used to be such a cheap, cheap, cheap person. If I bought a video game, I'd play every... I'd scour it. I'd play it till the end. Get 100% because I paid plenty of money for it. Recently, however, I bought... Ghost of Tsushima. And I, I don't like that game, man. And I paid $100 for it, so I'm going to have to put it down. I see it as an open world, like just the epitome of open world games now, like Horizon Zero Dawn, which I also didn't like. I, I may play Hades. I downloaded that and I like that. So I'm very much looking forward to taking a break in November, December, and even part of January and playing some video games and chilling John D. asks, question, you actively engage with your fans. How do you keep from being overloaded by their input? Firstly, John, I consider reading the comments as part of the work, and it's a joy of the work simultaneously. I'm lucky that 90% of the comments are extremely thoughtful and effusive. I take criticisms to heart, though, and I modify my behavior accordingly, hopefully for the better. To be clear, I don't have a bot that automatically hearts comments. I go through and read each one. And at some point, it's already getting to be a bit overwhelming. And at some point, I may get my wife to help out on that. Okay, if I don't get to your question in the live chat, that's because there are quite a few questions that I've already culled from people who have commented in various sources. But Grizz Walt Grimm live asks, will you be there for us when the rain starts to fall? I don't know how to answer that. Kurt Ryder wants to know, how did I do in high school? If you so high school, almost all of school, I did extremely poor in high school in particular. I don't know how I ended up getting into university, let alone University of Toronto, given my grades. I was poor in everything except math and physics. And even there, I didn't submit my assignments. I despised doing assignments. I can do well on exams. And I luckily had a physics teacher that said, Kurt, I don't want to be known as the guy who failed I don't, I'm not trying to sound egotistical, but he said this. I don't want to be known as the guy who failed the next Einstein because at the time I would ask him advanced physics questions. So luckily, even though I should have got a failing grade in physics, he gave me an 80 or 90 or, or what have you based on the exam alone. And perhaps that's what allowed me to get into math and physics at U of T. There are some people who asked questions before the live stream started. I don't have access to those. So if you don't mind, you can ask again. Mortar Sport asks, who is my dream guest? I've consistently said it's Donald Hofstetter. Daniel Dennett is also up there. Human being, what kind of light bulbs do you use to color the background? See, these, I don't mind answering. I like answering these behind the scene podcast questions. So as for a lighting setup, I have a light right here. Let's get closer. And that serves as a rim light, if you know what if you know a little bit about cinematography, serves as a rim light. I have two lights here, which are, I think they're called sad lamps. So they have the wavelength of the sun. This may be another reason why I have such extreme sleep problems, because when I'm having a 
podcast. Sometimes it goes on until 9 p.m. And what I have right here, it's telling me it's daytime for my subconscious. Hmm. As for behind me, I have... It's an infrared light therapy, which I just turn on, or my wife turns on. And it bathes the back in red. Roy Dobson, if you believe what Rupert and Leo have told you that you are God, wouldn't it be logical to investigate and follow that path with rigor, even if it reveals everything you took to believe is true to be false? I don't know by... I don't, I don't believe logic is the way to truth necessarily, unless one modifies what one means by logic. Most of the time when people make a statement that they think is logical or rational, it's driven by so many unconscious motivations. I think people have an unconscious motivation to believe they're, they're God. I think it also may be true depending on what God means. Well, if one takes God to be reality, you're a part of reality. In what way do you think... Okay, so this one comes from In Dream, aptly named because he asks, or he or she asks, in what way do you think we're living in Plato's cave? Plato's cave. Well... In many ways. I'll just leave it at that. In many ways. Scott Larkin asks, Kurt, thank you for your work. I know you're busy. However, would you consider checking out the Suspicious Observer's YouTube channel, looking at the 12,000 year disaster playlist? Yes, I would consider it as for whether or not I'll get around to it. That's another question. Thank you, Scott. So BC asks, having a conversation, how long do you think it would take Chris Langan to leave Leogura speechless? Okay. Well, to me, that'd be like loading a Nintendo game into a PS5 or vice versa. They're just incompatible, both in their philosophies and their disposition. I think both would leave one another speechless after a minute or two minutes. Griswold Grimm says, what would I like to be doing in five years? I'm not sure, and I imagine it's not this. My instinct tells me that this has about three years left in it. When I say this, I mean the Toe Channel. It would be great to continue to speak to people who I'm decidedly interested in and interviewing people for the, not for the sake of interviewing, but because I'm interested in speaking with them. I see many people who are podcasters speak to people just for the sake of bolstering their podcasts. And I don't, I would not like to be like that. Part of the appeal of this channel is it's something like Breaking Bad, where since its inception, there's a conceivable end goal it's more like a project than a podcast, and the project is explicating toes, which may have an end date. It's also perhaps the sub-project of cultivating one's own toe, perhaps my own or the community's. And just so you know, when I say the community's, what I'm referring to is the YouTube comments, but also the Discord and the subreddit. If you would like to go to those, the subreddit is reddit.com slash r slash theories of everything, and then the Discord, you'll have to look in the link for the invite. There's also a hilarious Kurt Jaimungle memes subreddit. And by the way, when I was speaking of criticism, taking criticism seriously, I also take those seriously because, well, when I say seriously, I mean, well, you can see if you look at some of them, what I'm referring to. Roy Dobson says, I avoided the question and I know it. Okay, let's see. So let's go back to the question. Would it be logical to investigate the, pot, the path that tells you that you believe you're God? I don't know. I don't know, Roy. I just don't know. Okay, Carmeister. Kurt, do you watch anime or read manga? Also, please interview Tom DeLong. I used to watch anime, but nothing more than what's on YTV, which is a Canadian channel, or the Cartoon Network. So Dragon Ball Z, Pokemon. I think I stopped watching anime after... Two episodes of Beyblades, which ruined it for me. Or Digimon, even. So I don't watch or read Berserk, for example, or Eva Evangelion, I believe. Or Gundam. I'm not hardcore. And just the fact that I would consider those to be hardcore shows you how little I read anime. As for Tom DeLong, yes, I will speak to Tom DeLong as for when, I don't know when. Inside Person wants to know, am I going to follow up with... Leo Gura's invitation to Las Vegas. And also, on a more serious note, I take that to be a serious question, though. On a more serious note, what is your daily personal development and spiritual routine alongside your toe quest? I consider Leo to be 
a close acquaintance bordering on friend, and when I do meet, I imagine it would be a friendship. As for my spiritual routine, I think it's more like an ever-present, incessant thinking about what is fundamental, what does fundamental mean, what does God mean, how can I be closer to God or the good. John D. asks, where does the inspiration for the direction of your YouTube channel come from? And please speak on the challenges of changing direction. So I didn't know what John meant by changing direction. I thought what he meant was this originally used to be Better Left Unsaid. This YouTube channel used to be called that. And then I changed it to the Theories of Everything channel. So I asked John to follow up. John says, for example, you changed direction and began talking about UFOs after that sad party. So I don't know what he means by sad party. I also don't consider the UFO topic to be tangential to toes. I see it to be intimately tied. Okay, Crypto wants to know when is Frank Yang planning to appear? 2022. I, I had to push that because I was so, and I still am so, so stretched. Yeah, absolutely stretched. I can't do it. Okay, Stuart Scott wants to know, Hey, Kurt, I've got a question for you. How do you deal with your base growing? And this growth inevitably including extremists and mentally ill people. What one person thinks is extreme to one is normal to another. That seems obvious. So it's difficult to define. For example, as being... is not particularly liking the vaccination of the entire world simultaneously an extreme view. Is being pro-communism extreme? Well, it depends on what one means by communism, I'm sure. I think people want to point the finger quickly and show that one side is fanatical for various unconscious reasons. I have a whole documentary dedicated to the subject called Better Left Unsaid. It's no simple feat to define what's extreme. I spent years thinking about it and I feel like I've barely scratched the surface on that. I also don't like to think of people as being Kurt fans. I don't think they should. I don't think they are. I think that if they were true Kurt fans, quote unquote, they wouldn't conceptualize themselves as such, because I constantly talk about questioning, which is the opposite of fandom slash following. I also rarely make statements for someone to follow. I mainly ask questions. See, I'm a fan of GPT-3, but GPT-3 makes no statements. So there's a difference between liking the quality of someone's work and liking them as a person or having an affinity for their views. Those are different. Karmeister says, you always ask the audience to refer to Dragon Ball Z characters in the chat. Who's your favorite Dragon Ball Z character? It would be Goku, or Vegeta, or Gogeta. I'm a Miyazaki fan, but I don't, th I don't think I'm a Miyazaki fan because of the anime, per se. He just makes great movies. I would like to visit Japan in particular because there's a Miyazaki museum there. And they also have, apparently, wonderful toilets. And I'm a huge germaphobe. So part of the reason I don't travel is because... I can't use toilets and I can't use other people's toilets. Oral decoy wants to know, am I overdoing the fasting? I haven't fasted in quite some time. Weeks even. I was having terrible, terrible, terrible sleep issues. And so I had to stop the fasting because that was inter interrupting my sleep. That's a hilarious question, the signal. If you could fusion dance with any person in a Dragon Ball Z manner, who would it be? I don't, I, it would yeah, it'd be my wife then. Or no one. Unless there's the novelty of doing it with someone temporarily. If it's permanent, I don't think I'd do it. Okay, Kurt. I am Mr. Nimbus. What do you think is going on at Skinwalker Ranch? And what experiment would you like to see? Do you hope aliens made us? Or not? What is the thing or who is the one that convinced you aliens are real? Okay, so firstly, who the heck knows what's happening at Skinwalker? As for whether or not I hope, I hope not that they made us. But at the same time, I think it's a sin to think that the universe isn't the way that it's supposed to be. So whichever way it turns out to be, I think I should be grateful for life. Third, I never said aliens are real. Mr. Nimbus says, by the way, I would love to buy some cool alien merch. Just so you know, this isn't a UFO channel, despite the popularity of the UFO videos. It's a theoretical physics, consciousness, free will, and God channel. And if UFOs turn out to be, let's say, purely artificial intelligence, then someone like Lex will handle it. For now, I see it as a physics and potentially metaphysics-related phenomenon, hence my investigation of it. It's also darn curious, man. 
as for the merch, just so you know, you can go to tinyurl.com slash toe merch, I believe. I'll type that in the chat. And there's merch, not UFO themed. There's merch for the next few days. It's ending October 31st. John D, again, John D, can you put a finger on how many times you felt your mind finally grasp a new concept? Or does that happen to you more on a daily basis? It happens sometimes zero times per day, sometimes multiple times per day. I would say it's more accurate to think of my mind as recontextualizing thoughts and adding layers, like those of you who know a little bit about computer graphics. You start with some unspecified sphere, and then you add some elements like a reflective map and a texture and an extrusion, albedo, asperity, the shape of the surface, its properties under destruction or collision, and so on. So for me, it's as if each toe or concept is blank. It's a blank metal ball with asperity with roughness equals zero. And then as days go by, I add more and more layers to it until hopefully I can say the toe back to the originator of the toe in a manner that they would agree. Perhaps it'd be better if I can even add to it. Einstein, Alberto, those toe socks seem pretty meta, and I'm digging it. Okay, well, again, if you'd like, you can go to the merch link, tinyurl.com slash toe merch. Those are available for the next few days. Frank Boyle says, congrats, my friend, on a very well-deserved 100K. My question is, my favorite inter my question, in my favorite interview, which was Rupert Spira, I was intrigued by the depth of your honesty and could feel an almost existential level of anxiety when you discussed your darker thoughts and, and fear and how you could act irrationally on impulse and so on. There was a sense, there was a sense that I was viewing Carl Jung's concept of the shadow being played out in real time. Well, that's embarrassing. So I, the guy says, I wonder if Frankie says, I wonder if you could elaborate on your on your personal beliefs for the raison d'etre by your guests. In short, what has impacted your way of thinking in a profound way? I started this podcast, I started taking this podcast seriously with Donald Hoffman in terms of delving into someone's papers deeply. And then with Thomas Campbell, I started taking it extremely seriously, experientially. Like I tried transcendental meditation for a few weeks and I think perhaps even months. Taking toe seriously has impacted my thinking, though I wouldn't, rather than one toe in particular, I, well, I don't know, maybe it would be Ian McGilchrist, Bernardo Castro, or, or Raymond Smully, and that's my favorite video on the whole channel, it's underrated, it has less than 10,000 views, and it's my favorite video, I think you should watch that, the Raymond Smully video. It's a mirthful dialogue between a mortal and God about free will and morality. Prosian Loter asks, congrats, Kurt, my question is this, what arguments and positions from the left do you find strongest and most convincing to you? So I did a quick Google search because it's not clear what makes the left left. For example, if you ask people on the left, they'll say, my side is good and I am pro freedom, but people on the right would say the same. As for left, when I did a quick search, I like the separation, the separation of church and state. I think that's a left-wing view, though that's, that's, I'm sure, debatable. I like when there's investment into city parks and beautifying the city in general. I like when there's a net to catch the indigent, the destitute, the penurious. J. Wartman1984 says, I just subscribed today because I thought I already was. Okay. I couldn't find you on my list. Haha, ha. great show. Bravo. What do you think about Travis Walton's testimony? Some of these questions are quite large, and so I'm trying to parse them. Make them concise. Okay, what, what do you think a trained body language expert would say of Lou wearing the hat that obstructs his face when answering questions? What do you think about that? I like Lou, but felt the hat was disingenuous, even deceptive. He was in Counter Intel, after all, and understands body language. See, for me, I think if he was in Counter Intelligence, he would not wear a hat, precisely because one wants to give the impression that one is being open. 
He would have been taught to speak with his palms out constantly. And the fact that he's not suave to me is indicative of him not being instructed to act in a manner that's convincing and amiable. The hat seems to me to be more of a comfort item, like that he's dealing with a heavy load, which is understandable. I've spoken to people who have made a living having an extremely high EQ, if EQ exists, having an extremely high ability to read someone's body language. And when I say that they make a living in it, I mean that they're not simply body language experts or people who give seminars as such, but people who make money analyzing other people. And they've said, they've expressed a similar sentiment with regard to Lou. Namely, that he's under stress and he isn't speaking with perfidy or duplicity. Just a regular guy with an anime profile picture asks, How would you rank the following four and why? Superman, Thor, Hulk, and Goku. So it goes Goku, Superman, Thor, and Hulk. I don't know who likes Hulk, man. The Zignal wants to know, Do you have advice for building a successful channel for aspiring podcasters or YouTubers? For aspiring YouTubers, I don't consider myself to be a YouTuber. I don't think I've ever said, Subscribe, man. Hit that notification bell. Smash that like button. I don't think I've ever said that I feel extremely... Well, I don't... I wouldn't like to say that. Hmm. As for podcasting... Watch each one of your own episodes. Colin Quinn, my favorite comedian, was asked, how do you get better at stand-up? So Seinfeld's advice is work. Just work. Colin Quinn's advice is tape every show and watch it. I agree with Colin Quinn and Seinfeld, by the way. Okay, Freedom Fighter, how many licks does it take to get to the center of a Tootsie Pop? Well, you can just look that up. I did a quick Google search, and it's approximately how many days there are in a year. I couldn't think of some profound answer to that question. Giovanni Pezin says, Not a question, but rather a request. Can you do a recap on how your view of God, life, and the universe, and everything has evolved? And what are your key life experiences? I don't think I can do that, man. Danger 6 says, may you please acknowledge that you have seen my super chat. I don't know, Danger 6, I have to now search for which... Oh, okay, I'm searching. Nope, I don't see it. Okay, but I see Scott Larkin. Scott Larkin says, have you tried kava, kava for sleep and anxiety? If not, you should. Traditional preparation method only. Avoid the extracts. I haven't tried that. Ryan P. asks, have you revisited TMU? No, I have not. Rob Warnick asks, what do you believe UAPs are? Have you heard theories about the Antichrist and such? No. I mean, yes, I've heard those theories. I don't know what they are. I imagine that if... Here's what I imagine they're not. I don't think they're purely... atmospheric phenomenon or lens flares and so on. I think that if one had a rock and threw it at an a, at a UAP or UFO... It would make a sound, provided that the UFO would allow it to hit it. Sorry, Danger Six, you're going to have to repeat. Vincent, thank you. Tom, assuming that Bob Lazar's story is true, and pairing it with Leo's, Louis Elizondo's idea that the U.S. is in possession of materials, how do we know the craft military members... I don't understand the question, Tom. I'm sorry. Oh, oh, oh. Tom, if what you're asking is, let's imagine there have been some recovered craft. How do we know that what we're seeing isn't our craft? That is repurposed craft. Could be. Though David Fravor says, extremely unlikely, given that they appear on battlefields. And if the U.S. wants to win a war or have some military objective, you wouldn't unduly scare the pilots right before a military operation or during a military operation. Danger 6 says, I have some evidence that suggests these beings may control people by terrorizing them in youth, then providing meaningful help in adulthood trauma bonds. That's extremely interesting. So Danger 6, if you have a link, DM me at Toe with Kurt on Twitter, and I'll include that link in the description. Marinka S. says, Dude, just appreciate you, man. Question is pretty much only one. How do you manage work-life balance? 
Firstly, I don't manage it well, and that's one of the reasons I'm taking November, December, and perhaps even January off as an extended respite, to breathe with my wife and with my family. Austin Harper says, My question for you, Kurt, is future humans will be born in artificial wombs and gene edited to basically eradicate any chromosomal disease or genetic disease of any kind. Second, if it's possible, are my parents and other loved ones actually any different than a stranger on the road? Should I treat them as different? Or should I treat other strangers like my brother and sister? Hmm. Okay. So it seems like it will be the case in the near future that people will be devoid of genetic flaws, quote-unquote. But I think in the long run, it will be that we may allow what we currently consider to be quote-unquote flaws to occur naturally because we have a better understanding, firstly, of what it means to be natural, as well as we see that there's a reason for people to be the way they are. And when I say a better understanding of what it means to be natural, right now we say whatever we do is unnatural. So is it, well, aren't we a product of nature? So is G are GMOs particularly unnatural? Is this condo unnatural? Is internet unnat the internet unnatural? I don't know. It seems, well, we're a part of nature. But from other vantage points, I see that it's considered to be unnatural. All of that is to say that I imagine we'll have a more refined notion of what it means to be natural. As for, should you treat the people you see on the street like your brother and your sister in terms of love? I don't think it's possible. But I also think that one should cultivate a stronger relationship with their family. So that is, raise the level of love with your family and raise the level of your love for your stranger such that today's average love for your family is six months from now's average love for the stranger. And then by then, your average love for your family has increased. So you use that as a slingshot to also increase the average love you have for people in general. Michael Frey, have you seen any significant patterns in all the incoming information that points to you to a particular direction? Now, I'm not sure if that's with regard to the UFO issue or toes in general. And I see similarities, yes. And I see differences. More similarities, though. The dark night or the dark light. There appears to be an instrument hanging on, <laughs> hanging on the wall behind you. Do you play music or have any other creative outlets? What music do you listen to? I don't listen to music. I find it extremely irritating. I find most music extremely, extremely irritating. I used to play songs. I used to play cover songs and minorly create my own. But since I've moved in here, I haven't played almost at all because I sing when I play and I sing so loud. These walls are paper thin. I can't, can't practice. I don't have the time anyway. As for other creative outlets, I can't think of any. Hmm. Hmm. I don't think so. I put almost everything into studying toes. Theories of everything. C-Ring wants to know, are you continually studying the CTMU, and how does it rank among the other toes you've looked into? So I'm diminutively studying it, and it's high up there in terms of the theories of everything I've, I've studied. Philip O, oh, and caveat, I don't particularly like to rank them. When I say high up there, I do have a, a nesting, though I wouldn't call that a valuation that's different. Philip O, oh, on a spectrum from Bach to Kastrup, where were you before starting this podcast and where are you now? I would say I'm f I was full on Bach in the materialist sense and now I'm torn in the middle watching mommy and daddy fight. Sullen Piffin or Sullen Puffin. That's a hilarious name. The Sullen Puffin asks, how quickly can you get Castrop and Bach head to head? Bach is not interested. <sighs> Kastrup would, but Bach is not interested. Mm, okay, Henrik Lance Hedstrom has a question about 
It's a quite a long question. And they, he essentially wants to know about time travel. So for me, time travel is filled with so many paradoxes that I don't know how to conceive of it. But just because I can't conceive of it doesn't mean that it's not describing some situation that's true in some non-trivial sense. I just don't know how to make sense of it. You can understand this. Like Carlo Rovelli has a great example of this. If you read some ancient text, I'll get into that in the Carlo Rovelli podcast, so I'm not going to speak about that now. Imagine Yellow Suns wants to know, would you, would you consider the topic of near-death experiences for your investigations and interviews? Yes, and I have Dean Radin confirmed, though not booked, for 2022. I have many guests confirmed. When I say confirmed, I mean they've said yes and I've said yes. But as for getting the actual date down, that's an arduous task. Lord Tyranus, did I find Chris Langan to be intimidating? Not particularly. Okay, I'm scrolling through now, so give me some time as I go through the live chat. Van Malwatt says, Great job on the last couple interviews, Kurt. Just watched the one with Travis. I wish you had gone into more details. You know what, Diavin? When I went into details with Travis, people took that as a sign of me interrogating him. And they thought that I was being, uh, well mean to him. I did find Travis, well, there was something that occurred directly before the Travis interview. I was irritated during it. That was the only interview that I was irritated just prior to conducting for a couple of reasons. I don't want to go into them without... I think it would sound like I'm bashing Travis. It has nothing to do with Travis's experience and more has to do with him as a person, but not his experiences. As for his experiences, I don't treat people skeptically on this channel. I treat people as if what they're saying is true and I'm curious what the consequences are. And am I understanding it correctly? It's pretty much just that. What are the consequences? Am I understanding it correctly? Can I add to it? Does it contradict anything that I currently know? Office hours. I've said this many times. I treat it like I have a professor and I'm blessed enough to have office hours with this person. So I don't go into a professor's office hours being skeptical of the person. I treat them as if they're superior to me, at least in some ways. Daniel Jake Jacobian says, thank you for the journey you've decided to take. Thank you, Daniel. Scott, are you familiar with the episode of Coast to Coast in 97? No, I'm not familiar with that. <laughs> Robin Robinson. Thoughts on Einstein's theory of non-empty space and gravity as a pressure force caused by displacement of dark matter. I don't think Einstein had a theory of dark matter. I don't think it was discovered any time around when Einstein was alive. And I don't know of his theory of non-empty space. If you mean dark energy, that's different. Okay, Brandon Caro says, Have you or Christopher Langan considered a stream with Jean Francois Garapi? Now, I don't know what Christopher Langan has considered, so I can't speak for him. I have not considered a stream with Gene. I don't know who Gene is. There are plenty of times when people will message in the comments and say, you should check out so-and-so person. My process is I mentally note them first, and then once I see enough of them, then I start to physically note them, and then I contact them. And then, I, well, I research them, and then I contact them. Abdi Debato wants to know, how did you quit your mathematical career? Well, firstly, I never had a mathematical career. I stopped math and physics when I went into filmmaking. But even if you watch my films, there's such a heavy framework of math and physics. The same analytical mind I apply to the film. I apply to the film story and to the filmmaking. And I've always been interested in theories of everything. Almost as long as I can remember. When I say as long as I can remember, I mean... Since I was a kid, since I first thought about, well, how did the universe come to be and learned of the concept of quantum fluctuations. Pseudohuman says, what toe of all the guests do you resonate with most or think is most valid? I would say Chomsky. And I'll leave that as a, I'll leave that for you to interpret what that means. From start to free, Gary Sigmund asks, Kurt, you should try to get Nassim Haramin on for an interview. Okay, by the way, 
people who ask to be interviewed, it's generally not a great sign that you have to be asked. For example, if someone says, I can disprove Leo, what Leo Guru is saying, and thus I should be interviewed. That's not enough for me to interview you just because you have a critique of someone. I'm interested in constructions and entire worldviews that are different. Well, I use instinct and intuition to guide me. It's just, it's not enough for someone to say, you should interview me. And people get extremely offended, extremely offended when I don't have the time to look into their theories or have them on the channel. And part of the reason is I take each theory of everything extremely seriously. I, I take them extremely seriously, so I don't have time. And every single, almost each person will say, my theory of everything is the theory of everything to end all theories of everything. Okay, how do I adjudicate between the different people putting their hands up that say the same sentiment? G. Bernal wants to know, apparently we had an email exchange, exchange and this person wants to know, what do I think of the UFO topic? Essentially, it's a long question, but essentially, what do I think of it? And it's unfair to ask me that, because I didn't know how vast this topic would be when I entered it. Think of it like I thought it was one painting, and it turns out that it's an art gallery, and now I've been zoomed along in the Louvre, and you're asking me, what do you think of the Louvre? Well, I see patterns. That's all I can make of it for now. I can't rank them. John D, again, John D, many questions. When you do need to increase your staff, I do already. I would like to get someone to do video editing, for example, or the Toe Clippings channel. When you do increase your staff, will you advertise toe jobs? Now, this is hilarious. <laughs> I may. I don't, I'm not sure. Prathima Najendra wants to know, what a guy, what a channel, more power to you. You haven't invited any hardcore biologists, and I'm going to put slash materialists because many people have said that, on your channel. That's not true. That's not true. People say that. That's There's Bach, first of all. There's Rebecca Goldstein, Stephen Wolfram, Robert Kuhn, though he wouldn't admit that he's a materialist, Richard Borchards, Methuna, David Sloan Wilson, Anil Seth, Sabine Hassenfelder, Steven Pinker, Nathan Mirvold, Avi Loeb, I believe, is a materialist, Kevin Knuth, I'm not sure, but maybe, Michael Levin, maybe, Chomsky, somewhat, Carl Friston, somewhat, Jor Barnetton, definitely, most not most, many people are adamant, atheist, materialist, hardcore, biological basis for consciousness. And they'll say, they'll, well, I'll leave it at that. Mel Taylor, my son is studying physics, math, and computer science, A level. Would you recommend physics as a degree? No, unless you want your your son to live with you until you're until they're 40 i would recommend computer science beers added you what are the most interesting fascinating ideas to you right now in relation to your channel of course not free will not toe not god but some new idea that you've read about heard from your guests something from physics perhaps maybe something about ufos maybe something political that got you really thinking what are you hyped about right now Hmm, what am I hyped? What am I hyped about? Hyped about? Hmm, hmm, hmm. I think I am hyped about something. As for what? Hmm. Hmm. Hmm, hmm, hmm. The Lohenheim Skolem theorem and the nature of infinity. When I was talking to Leo Gura, he made it clear that he believes the infinity of all infinities is reality. Now, that's not... Look, Cantor even thought that, but even but Leo would say that's a model of infinity and so on. However, when Leo was delineating what he believes infinity to be, imagine a movie, and now imagine a cup, now imagine a movie about a cup, now imagine a movie about a cup making a movie about a cup, and so on and so on and so on. I don't think he realizes how embedded in Aleph Zero that is. What I mean is, that's all still Aleph Zero, that's all still the natural numbers. He thinks... What he was outlining was Aleph 1 or Aleph 2. There are different levels of infinity. But those are all, if you can point to it, it's part of the natural numbers. The natural numbers are a huge, 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 huge set, in other words. Gerald Pavlovich says, you often expect 
or say that you expect the next paradigm shift to come from the fringe. And I'm wondering, could you elaborate on your definition of fringe and why you believe this spirituality slash physics of consciousness merger will or must, which I, yes, will or must come from the outside? And what are those groups you consider to be fringe? Hmm. So firstly, Einstein worked in the patent office. Keep that in mind. That's fringe in some respects. But I'm sure that's not what you mean, nor what I mean. I mean mainly that the fringe will be... That I, I do think it will be someone or some people from the center, let's say not fringe, that take that torch past the goalpost. I think they'll be heavily informed and advised and apprised by the fringe. But the reason I say it will come from the center, too, is because the fringe doesn't necessarily have the technical know-how of how to make their statements precise or how it comports and doesn't comport with other theories. For example, most of, most of the time when... Almost any time when someone mentions quantum physics, it's an indication to me they don't know what they're talking... They don't... They generally don't know what they're talking about. And you'll see this. Even Brian Keating said this. People will email him and say, Einstein was wrong. It's rarely Boltzmann was wrong. And the reason is that people read what they read in popular science. Now, there's an advantage to that. Well, the disadvantage... What I think... I think people should stop trying to sound astute and tutored and just be. And that one's gift may be that they're... That they're not particularly astute in those domains. And because of that, they're able to make these wide-reaching jumps that someone who is not untutored, they could never make those jumps. For example, for me, when it comes to filmmaking, I'm so engrossed in filmmaking, or I was, that a new filmmaker can innovate far more than I can, because certain shots wouldn't occur to me. Certain editing techniques I would dismiss unconsciously before it's even reached my conscious mind as being something that wouldn't work. That's an example. So it's okay to not be particularly precise. That's why I say that the fringe will inform the center, and the center will be the one that takes it past the goal but the center won't be able to do so without the fringe. So they both need one another. And they both should stop deriding one another. So someone, James Jones, this is hilarious. So Sir Roger Penrose was on the Joe Rogan podcast talking about the emperor's new clothes. I think he means new mind. After a retired anesthesiologist contacted him to tell him about microtubules and so on. Do you think that you can talk about this on your podcast? microtubules and such. Have you heard of it? Okay, so this happens so frequently that someone will say, have you heard of this? Someone said, have you heard of Thomas Campbell? You should speak with him. Man, I have two podcasts with Thomas Campbell. So I don't know what to do with that. I'm, I can't expect everyone to just search the catalog of Toe before asking a question. It's just funny to me because then I have to find the URL and I have some hotkeys for the most popular videos and I just send that to them. I think it would be snarky if I said, Google is your friend. Search. Danger6, you said that you can't tell me or tell people publicly. Well, then DM me on Twitter. Ian from Scotland says, am I familiar with Phil Snyder? No. Samwell wants to know, what are my views on remote viewing? I don't have many views on remote viewing. I think it's possible. I don't see why not. I, I, there's so much that is traditionally thought of as obviously insensate that I don't see as obviously insensate. Lucid dreaming. Well, lucid dreaming is great. I, I happen to be lucky enough that I can lucid dream. Altered states of consciousness through meditation or psychedelics. Well, what are my thoughts on them? I don't, I don't, what are my, they're powerful states that can radically change your worldview. That's what I think of them. Someone wants to know, can I get Bob Lazar on the show? I'm trying to get Bob Lazar on the show. It's not going to happen. It's seeming like it's not going to happen. Someone wants to know, is Clee Irwin of Quantum Gravity Research Fringe? David wants to know that. To some people, he is. I haven't researched him enough to make a decision. He seems extremely mathematically sophisticated, so I wouldn't consider him to be as such. Alex Q asks, I'm interested in some of the books you found useful in developing your interviewing skills. Did you develop on the job or do you have some recommendations? I don't I, the, I don't see myself as having interview skills. When people say I have an interview style, I'm nonplussed. I don't know what to make of that because I just see myself as 
asking questions. I just see myself as, again, treating someone as if they're a professor during office hours. It's as simple as that, and that's pretty much it. I don't know about interview skills per se. Hmm. Hmm. M. Diaz wants to know, have you asked if these UFO crafts are living organisms? I think I have. I don't know. Roman Stepanov wants to know, what would you want to happen to your consciousness after death? Well, it depends on what what death is. So if death is the ceasing of consciousness, then that question, as it stands, makes little sense or is contradictory, which doesn't mean it's not worth investigating. I think it would be great if we lived forever and were happy. I think... I think that's pretty clear. Okay, someone said, what happened? So, Sadia Adani said, what happened to the last video with Luis Elizondo? We saw it live, and then it became private. Okay, so because of that, I'm going to read to you some of my thoughts. I generally make these live streams private after I've live streamed because I treat them like a sports event, or any li like a play, let's say. If you come halfway through the play, you miss half of the play. You don't get to see the first part. Or if you do, then you're going to miss the latter half. You have to catch it from the beginning to the end, just like you would in real life. I treat it as if it's real life, which is different than YouTube. Like, YouTube doesn't have a term for that. I wish YouTube had a different word that I could use, like a different setting to indicate that this is that type of event. If you miss it live, you miss it live, and you have to then wait for the DVD edition. You have to wait for it to be edited. And there's a reason why I edit it. Hmm. See, people who, for example, everyone here watching live, they can deal with my long pauses and my incoherent ramblings. But when you watch it, for most people, now some people will object and say, no, 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 I like that. I love watch. I love Joe Rogan just because of that. Okay, well, I'm not at Joe Rogan's level. I'm actually an extremely small creator, relatively so. So I use some of the filmmaking skills that I've gleaned over the years to make it a better pristine product each podcast i put out is like a gem each one is like a pristine gem or i try to make it like that one of the ways is with well the audio that comes through here via zoom is compressed people don't realize how much audio matters for the end product for example in films audio matters much more than the visual experience okay so there's that i need to change it for posterity for people who watch it after when you're watching it live you have the added exhilaration of this extemporaneous factor there's a thrill but it's it's not a great experience for those who come later i've written this down on the subreddit reddit.com slash r slash theories of everything also i tend to put out the video fairly soon so it shouldn't be too much of a big deal for people 24 hours to 48 hours later there's also conversations that happen between me and a guest off air before I ever go live, and then often after I end going live, such as, well, there are plenty of examples of that, and I include some of that with the person's permission. That won't be there. And then also people tend to share the live stream. Let's imagine I unlist it. People will then share the unlisted live stream. Not every hit, but almost each hit matters for a small creator like myself. So when someone shares the live stream, which I've heard some people saying, are we going to have to record this now? If people start recording them, then I'm going to have to just keep the conversations off air because people will share that. That will get popular. And then people won't come to the Toe channel or associate it with the... So... So that's the reason I put them as private. There's other reasons. Plenty of other reasons, too. When someone says, which guests' theories are most aligned with mine, I'd say Chomsky. And again, I'll leave that for you to interpret. Vincent Weaver says, Kurt, my phone dies, and I may have missed my question answered. I did two super chats, two super chats about Avi Loeb. I can't find the man, so say it to me again, and make sure you at me so that it shows up more blatantly. Art Meditation says, Hey, Kurt, thanks for your contribution. Is there going to be a part three with Leo Gura? Maybe. Maybe quite some time from now, man. That Leo Gura video took... I was dealing with so much at the time. So much. 
and I still, well, I was dealing with quite a bit, and I still put out that video, and so because of that, that knocked me out for a while, for a little while, and turned me off of not interview, not speaking with Leo, but turned me off of doing a pristine podcast with Leo because it takes so much work. In the editing, mainly, mainly the editing. Natalie wants to know, do I know about Balaji? That's the future. I don't know about Balaji. Walker Dale says, after speaking with Leo, what did you get reading between the lines of what he said? Huh, huh, huh. That is, that is for me to keep to myself for now. I don't like to say my thoughts as they're unformed. I think Wittgenstein had this quote about what one cannot speak of precisely, one must be silent. Now, there are obviously flaws with that. But generally, I stick by that. Lance Wieda says, Why do you believe in God? Any evidence? So, firstly, I asked, Who said I believe in God? And what definition of God is this person referring to when asking for my belief in it, slash him, slash her, slash whatever? Lance replied, I could be mistaken. But on the interview with Les Stroud, you implied the existence of a God. I don't think I did. If I did, please send it to me. Then this person said, my apologies if I was wrong. If so, I'd like to re-ask, what are your thoughts on the idea of God? So I don't know. I don't know what some... See, most people have the idea of God that's something akin to a disembodied, powerful human who created the earth in the same way that we create chairs and tables. And I'm unsure if it's like that. Rahul asks, Kurt, are you Indian? I am from Trinidad. Trinidad and Tobago. Someone asked if I was Sri Lankan. No, I'm from Trinidad. Kosa Nostra Blonde says, I subbed for your Yosha Bach interview. Could you elaborate on what it's like to be, what it was like talking with him from your perspective? And do you have any takeaways from that episode? Talking with him was like talking with anyone else. There wasn't, there was no awe factor particular to him. As for takeaways, see, I don't remember much. Much of all of my podcasts are blurs. It's like, when you do an exam and it's a blur, which is why I need a break. It's not, for example, it's not enough to read the Bible. One needs to meditate on it. It's not enough to read some text. One needs to meditate on it. I need to meditate on what I've studied and I haven't been. Okay, Boris Martin, Boris Costello. Congrats, dude. You are going to the moon for sure. Thanks, man. I feel like I'm on the moon already, though. Like, when people say you're going to get a certain amount of subs, I I tend to... I'm ambivalent about hearting those comments. I don't particularly care about those... about having more subscribers than I do. I like a, the I like the quality of the subscribers that currently the Toe channel has. And and if it can continue like this, then that's... Like, I'm, I'm so happy. Almost each day, every single day, I'm excited for the work that I get to do. It's like an absolute blessing. Okay, what is your favorite movie of all time? Boris asks. Not the top three or top five, just one. Shoot. Boris, I don't have a, I don't have a just, well, okay, if it was just one, it's There Will Be Blood. And then if it's a top three, it's There Will Be Blood, No Country for Old Men, and Schenectady, New York. And those are somewhat tied for number two. Schenectady, New York, and There Will and no country for all men. There will be blood is holds a special place in my heart. All those were, I think, released within months of one another. There have been other films I've I've loved dearly. Call Me by Your Name is a wonderful, wonderful film. Those three though, There Will Be Blood, Schenectady, New York, and No Country for Old Men are king. Richard Brewster, you've mentioned the possibility of writing a book about toes, theories of everything. Can you say something about how you will come at this big topic? Will you try to be objective by describing and comparing some of the selected toes? Will you write about how your interviews with the scientists slash mystics and so on have impacted you personally? I don't think I'll write that in the book. Again, I'm not particular, I don't particularly like talking... I'm much more comfortable asking questions than I am answering questions. 
someone said, I think you could pull a lot together in such a book, and I would sure I would surely buy it. So that's Richard Brewster. Uh, so as for the objective question, will I be objective? I don't use the word objective to describe anything I do, nor anything anyone else does. Well, what I would like to do would be a conspectus of toes, that is, to write a book with a page or two, or three or four, depending, on each toe in a manner that the originator of the toe would say, sure, that sounds about right. Roy Dobson says, congratulations on your success, you deserve it. Do you find that personally you're getting closer to a toe? And two, do you think discovering a toe, how do you think discovering a toe would affect your subjective experience? I gave this analogy before with the swimmer who's underwater. Let me, I don't know if I can remember it precisely. It's as if I have a flashlight and I can see a certain distance above me and I hope that I'm swimming upwards and I have a an estimate as to how far I have to go to reach the surface. And while I'm swimming upward, the flashlight increases, but so does my estimate as to how much work is left increases. And as for how do I think discovering a toe would change my subjective experience, I think it would be transformative. In the positive sense, though I'd say I'm too cowardly to accept it in any form it may take. The law of one says, love your channel, brother. What do you personally think happens after we die? I don't think it's lights out like a computer. I don't think it's the afterlife we think about either. It may be. It may be both in some manner. I'm not averse to paradoxical, contradictory deliberation, especially on topics that people would consider to be deep, because most of what we consider to be deep is metaphysical, and most of what's metaphysical is not defined precisely, and thus, as we talk about it, it's going to be contradictory. Prashanti Dutta says, thank you, Kurt. I'm curious how you prepare for these interviews. I think I said that before, I pretty much look up lectures on the person. I watch some of their other interviews. I go to their Google Scholar page, sort by most cited and sort by most recent, and look at the top few. If they have textbooks or, well, if they're an academic, they'll have textbooks. I may skim those. If they have books, then I'll try to read them. Pretty much just that. And then I write down whatever questions occur to me. That's it. I just write them down, whatever questions occur to me. And I'm doing this over the course of a, a week or two weeks. And I constantly say, I can't say right now because this will go off. I say, okay, Google. All right. So I say that. And then I say note to self and so on. Steve Sanders says, Kurt, two questions I haven't heard that are bugging me. Is the movie industry preparing humanity for disclosure? Through science fiction movies, a sort of soft, slow disclosure. No, I think why we see science fiction movies is indicative that the public is craving content like this or content on topics about this. You can view it in a Jungian sense that the collective expresses some unconscious desire. The market will express some unconscious desire of people. I also think you're giving Hollywood far too much credit. They're just avaricious. They care about dollar amount. The only morality is ostensible morality when it comes to Hollywood. They have no long-term plan for disclosure. They don't care about the public being informed other than being informed for something of their own construction that aids their bottom line. They're acquisitive. They don't care about diversity, for example, as, as much as they say they care about diversity. And I have some stories about that which I don't need to get into, but it's, it's just hilarious that they'll say that they care so much about diversity. It's hilarious to me. They don't. They just care that they would be criticized if they don't pretend that they do. Okay, so Fettuccine Split, I think that's how you say it, asks, what would your last meal be? No limits. Okay, let's think about this. It would be any meal. Firstly, I wouldn't be hungry. And it would be any meal with my wife. That's it. Whatever is with my wife. Okay, that's not terribly uplifting. Let's see. I 
how do you manage david smale says how do you manage to consistently attract the caliber of guests you have on your show do you have a script yes i do have a script and i can send it to you personally david just message me and i'll share it with you not with other people and the script has changed now it's now i don't need to have a script i can just send someone a one-liner and say hey check out the toe podcast would you like to be interviewed on it now because it it has the following that it does i be a bit more insouciant with the construction of the email and mostly it's luck it's a profusion of luck profusely someone matt said how do we how should we treat people like neil degrasse tyson and others who think this name namely what we consider to be paranormal and pseudoscience and so on who thinks that this is all bs are they beholden are they ignorant paid not to speak can we trust what they're saying i think that we should treat them with love like everyone else i think that it's easy for us to say to them you're insensate and asinine and you call yourself a skeptic but you don't do x y and z like a skeptic should yeah do that and see how far it takes you what is the goal is the goal to win this this transient dialogue and sacrifice the greater battle well in some ways that's how we got here with the skeptics deriding you or us other people being condescending i advocate not for and i don't i wouldn't say advocate but i i wouldn't say treat people with respect i'd say treat them with consideration and love and warmth ask them questions and don't do so in a patronizing manner. And respond with humility because maybe they are correct. Maybe there's nothing to this UFO phenomenon. Maybe there's nothing to any of of psychic phenomenon and remote viewing and so on and life after death. And maybe it's true that we're just a collection of atoms that somehow via some Bachian mechanism produce consciousness. That could all be true. Who knows? So approach them as if you're trying to find the truth in what they're saying, even if they're dislogistic to you. Treat them sincerely and warmly. So Too Honest But True says, Why can't Kurt just talk? He chooses his words so wisely it's annoying. On a good note, happy to have someone like him interested in UFO. We need more minds like him. <laughs> okay, so that's a twin compliment and insult in some manner. Well... Like I mentioned, it's a combination of a nervousness and also determining what I think is not easy. People think, well, people, see, part, I'm not going to, mm, part of the problem or part of our problem in society is people say what sounds intellectual or sounds impressive in some manner. And they don't think, they don't realize that what they've said has been adopted from someone else. There's also a war of options happening in me, so maybe there's three things I could say, and then I see critiques with each, or critiques with one or two of them, and then I'm... So I'm de I'm choosing between what to say. I'm also then doing some comparison between what I potentially could say and how I feel, and does that match? Because what's presented to me by my unconscious is not always what I think but just what's a reflex. That's almost the definition of reflex. It's a terribly confounding act to think for myself. James Curtis says, I wonder how much you sleep. I don't think you stopped sleeping. I actually got an aura ring because of this. And it tells me consistently that I'm not getting restful sleep. Like, I haven't had a restful night of sleep in since I got the device. I can get... REM sleep and deep sleep, but my restfulness score is always so low. Chris Salazar, what are your thoughts on Penrose's conformal cyclic cosmology, right? I need to research it. That's what I think about it. Hamid Halal, about IQ. I think I answered that in my last AMA. Chris Salazar, is, Ro is Roger Penrose difficult to get as a guest? Yes. TT Kaizuku asks, "What are your thoughts on Ken Wilber's spiral dynamics?" I I'm not a fan of spiral dynamics. 
I just think it's... Yeah, I'm not a fan of Spiral Dynamics, though I need to look more into it. A123, thank you. Tom says, what new info did you get out of the Luis Elizondo interview? Does he seem like he's more willing to reveal more info, or is it just the amazing questions? Mm. I wish I could say my thoughts about about that. I would just say there's a method to the madness between Luis Elizondo and myself in terms of question and answers. Andrew J says, my toe mug arrived today. Great. So if anyone has some toe merch, just tweet it at me. I would like to include some pictures of them. By the way, everyone who's watching, you should check out the 100,000th video. I'll link it here. That, along with the Raymond Smullyan video, has got to be my favorite video. And that was put together by a Redditor named Not My Account, who also runs the Reddit account called, I mean, the subreddit called Kurt Jemungo Memes, which I'll link there. Okay, so Hamad wants to know, what do I think of string theory? That's another example. When I say, people will say, Einstein is clearly wrong, and people are trying to sound hmm, shrewd in some manner. They, and they'll parrot what they've been heard, what they've heard. They'll say string theory is unfalsifiable. Well, like, you don't know. Like, I, I'm studying string theory, and it's, it's... How do you get to the stage where you can even say that it's unfalsifiable? String theory has had implications in condensed matter physics, for example. So it's not as if it's not salutary for physics as a whole. People will just say what they've heard. That's what I mean by it's people... It's difficult to think for oneself. Natalie says, how much money do I need to spend on a super chat to get you to look up the 1929 project when you get off this stream? Balaji is kind of an oracle. I don't know. I, I mean, it, I'll look it up for zero dollars. I'll try. Kundalini. Kurt, can we have more theolocutions? I'm trying to. I'm trying to find. It's actually difficult to find what fits with the channel. I'm looking to have two mathematicians debate the nature of infinity. I think that's going to be so wonderful. So the nature of the ZFC set theory, well, the nature of infinity is tied to that because of the C, the axiom of choice. And what computational logic versus, I forget what it, intuitionist logic versus classical logic, I believe. Johnny Cash says, I'm always happy to watch your videos, informative, helpful, and meaningful discourse. Thank you, man. Thank you. Ryan Betts, if you could pick one piece of knowledge to be answered and you know for certainty it's reality, what would you pick? Ah, ah that's, a, that's a tough question, man. Let's say, so what immediately comes to mind is what happens after one dies. But, would you want to know the answer to that? Like, there are some answers that if it was the case, would you be willing to accept it? Big X says, knowing what you do now versus prior to your first UAP interviewee, how has your perspective changed and are you worried for your children? Mm. Firstly, I don't have children. I would like I'm, I would like to have a child. Mm. 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 I don't think I would be... No, I, I am worried, but I think that's any potential parents. That happens at every generation. You're worried about your kid. Oh, this is a great question. Underscore asks, has anyone showed you classified things? No. I wish they... Well, I don't know if I wish they would. Do you believe humans are being monitored by aliens with super advanced technology? I, I see it being... I see it's conceivable that that's the case. Look, if China can potentially monitor all of what's happening here, and I'm sure the U.S. is monitoring China. How is this so out of the realm of possibilities that someone far more advanced is doing the same to us? Though, though it may be the case that... As you're younger, as you're less wise, you're more inclined to look at someone's phone, let's say, and snoop into someone's email or read some sheet of paper you're not supposed to. But as you, I imagine this is the case as one gets more quote-unquote wise 
one is disinclined to do so because you believe this is someone's private even if there's information that is that affects me or reveal some lie of theirs that they said to me and so on that's their information that's their privacy so it could be the case that with the technological advancement assuming aliens are more technologically advanced then it may be the case that they have a morality system such as that, so perhaps they could monitor us and choose not to for some reason like that. Kurt, would you have Alex Jones on? No, I'm not interested. Like maybe if I looked up Alex Jones, but I haven't looked. I haven't seen much about Alex Jones other than I, I've seen that he looks like someone who works out extremely and is angry, but I don't know much about him, so. I would, I would potentially have on Alex Jones, but I don't know anything about him. Natalie says 7, 20, 17, 29. It's making sure that we place that into our working memory. Spiritual astronaut, are there some areas related to the nature of consciousness that you consider to be too taboo and perceived as shameful, too shameful to talk about seriously? I don't think so. Not particularly, and that's either fortunately or unfortunately, depending on how one looks at it. What is the reason for you delving into these conversations on physics, consciousness, and free will? Says, Saiyan, I am. I'm interested and I don't have a reason outside of something that I would simply confabulate to give you an answer. It's difficult to discern one's own motivations. So I'm, I'm going to keep this to myself until I've done enough soul searching. I find this topic wonderfully prepossessing. I'll say that. For reasons outside my awareness. Word Counterino Cripperino. I love that name, by the way. I also try journaling too in the morning. So Kurt, if I may ask, do you open up a new document and write on a blank slate each morning, or is it one large document? So just for some background, I try to do some writing each morning. Just a few minutes. It's never an empty document. I have thoughts that occur to me throughout the day and my Skimble Scamble voice notes, which I record incessantly that my wife hates because I interrupt almost whatever I interrupt whatever we're doing. Like, let's say we're watching a movie, I have to press pause or we're going for a walk. I have to in the middle of a conversation note to self, so and so and so. So I have these short notes that I need to expand upon later. And I generally take those incoherent ramblings and then enlarge in them. I have themed docs and I place them in their proper place. Tadija Mitrovich wants to know, was there a moment in the Langan interview that something clicked where the, where you had an understanding of some concept that you had struggled with before? I believe it happened twice during that interview, but I don't remember. I don't remember what it was. Rad, JRE says, if Kurt is so smart, why doesn't he ask glaringly obvious follow-ups? He does have a velvety voice, though. Well, thank you, Rad. I'm not terribly bright, and I'm unsure what follow-ups you're referring to. See, much of the time, what someone thinks is obvious is not obvious to me and vice versa. And also, there are quite a few plates that are being spun simultaneously whenever I'm speaking to someone. So choosing exactly what question to ask next is not a trivial task. So for example, I'm thinking, well, what would the person say to this? And if I can predict it, I generally don't ask it. If I can predict what the person's going to say, even if it's interesting, well, if it's sufficiently interesting, I'll ask it. But if it's insufficiently interesting, I'm not going to ask it. And most of the time, before the interview, I can heavily emulate the person in my head. For example, with Leo Gura, before we started speaking, I told him, I understand your theory at an intellectual level. If someone, I could, but this is presumptuous of me, but if someone was to ask Leo Gura a question, I could answer it and people wouldn't be able to tell the difference. That's what I mean, that I can emulate. So I try to get to the point where I can emulate the person. That's how I know that I have an intellectual understanding. It doesn't mean that I have an embodied understanding because, well, that's completely different. So if I can predict what the person's going to say, I tend to not ask it. I'm also thinking of the other questions that I have because I only have a certain amount of time with the person. I'm also thinking about where is the audience right now, though I do so minimally because I tend to be selfish and think about as if it's a one-on-one. -on -one. That still, though, in my mind, where's the audience in terms of the progression of what we've talked about so far? I'm also thinking of the person that I'm interviewing's stamina, how long they can, how long they'll take to answer the question, how they will take the question, 
That is how they will interpret the question. I watch their body language. I see if I'm pushing in a direction that will loosen them or tighten them or invigorate them or be less receptive to follow-ups in this area. But it's also like chess where I can see or I try to see a couple moves ahead. So if I was to ask this, this would lead to this, this would lead to this. So perhaps a better avenue is this. So that's also what's going on in my head. I'm also relating it, like this is mainly what's happening too, is I'm relating, relating it to concepts I already understand, contextualizing it. So all of that's occurring simultaneously. And when you say that I don't ask glaringly obvious follow-ups, I'm doing, well, perhaps I'm not. And that's those are some of the reasons. I have a feeling what's underneath this person's question is that I'm not being skeptical enough. But like I said, my job, I don't see myself as being skeptical. I'm not there to critique them. I'm there to try to understand them. Plenty of people, they'll say, hey, you weren't tough enough on Luis Alessandro or tough enough on so-and-so. I invariably ask, what do you mean? Like, what would be a question that I should have asked that I didn't? And they're almost always questions about how do I know what the person is saying is true? Well, like I said, I go in assuming the person is truthful and then thinking, what are the consequences and how do I relate it to other concepts that I know? How can I understand this? For example, I feel like Leo Gura is truthful when he says that he believes he is whatever he says he is. And then I'm curious, okay, if you believe that, do you not also believe this? And so on and so on. I'm not going to say, no, you're just saying that because you want money. Someone else can do that. Hi, Yui says, I'm interested. I, no, this one's a bit personal. Well, in one of my videos, I said, I think the Leo Gura video in the description, not in the video itself, in the description, I said that I want to thank Jess Palmer. Jess Palmer is someone who, let's see, I wrote an old friend who I realized more and more was right about spiritual matters, despite my regretful obstinance and derision. What I mean is that I had a close friend named Jess, named Jess, and we would talk about philosophy, and I was so pig-headed and rude. This is another reason why I say that it doesn't matter if you win, quote-unquote, win an argument, doesn't mean you're right. Because sometimes someone can be right and not be articulate enough to express that they're right, or say it in a manner that well, anyway, I would unconsciously view each of our interactions as a sparring battle, and I would just try to prove him wrong, rather than get to quote-unquote the truth. And it took me an inordinately long time to realize I was doing that, and it was hurtful to him, extremely hurtful, damaged. It was, it was damaging to him. And I realize more and more now that Actually, he was right in so many ways, so many ways. And I just regret that I treated him like that. Some of Toe has, it's positively influenced Toe in the sense that I take that attitude, this attitude of, you know, maybe what this person is saying is correct and they're just not saying it correctly. So can I add to it? Can I approach it from a different angle? Not to critique it, not to destroy it, but to perhaps create with it. So this is, I have plenty of, plenty to thank Jess for and plenty to apologize to him for. Kevin Cregan says, Kurt, I wanted to ask you about your statement that you had noticed that various individuals in the non-dualist spiritual school, as well as other teachers like Thomas Campbell, had impressed you as being more or less phony. Well, I don't think I said that Thomas Campbell was phony. And if I did, I take that back. I don't think of him as phony. In fact, I think the way Thomas Campbell thinks and the way that I think are so alike that it's almost like watching myself. For example, he was speaking to Rupert Spira in some video last month or two months ago. It was like watching myself speak to Rupert Spira in what he was putting up against Rupert Spira. For example, he was saying, how do you know there's, some, there's not something outside consciousness? Well, Tom, is that not an unscientific question? Yes, but, well, it, but how do you know? Well, Tom, why would you have to assume in the materialist paradigm? So the way that Tom and Spira were speaking with one another, just the way that I was speaking to Spira, 
Kevin, if you can find where I said that I believe Thomas Campbell to be phony, then please send that to me and perhaps the context will reveal what I meant or I simply misspoke or I was simply wrong. So Lord Tyranus wants to know what's my favorite theory of everything so far. To be honest, it's usually the theory that I'm, that I'm currently studying. That's usually my favorite. And so that's a secret right now. Dirt Flyer wants to know if I can get Bob Lazar on the show. I'm trying to get Bob Lazar on the, sh the show. As for what I would like to ask him most, it would be some technical physics questions about the strong force and gravity. Phil Parker says, thank you so much for being open-minded and not sticking to a narrative and asking good questions. Thanks, Phil. I'm not particularly open-minded. I know people say that constantly. I would just say that I... I'm foolish. I'm too foolish to have a worldview, and thus I don't know what's true, and so I'm naive rather than open-minded. Emma Emma says, Have you heard of Robert Lanza's theory of biocentrism, that consciousness creates reality? Well, I've heard of many theories that say consciousness creates reality. As for Robert Lanza, he's on the list. I don't think I've emailed him, though. I may have. Natalie says, Balaji, again, Balaji is bringing poor people like me from all over the world on board to be the change we all need in the world. He's an angel investor. I feel so lucky to be a part of the changing world. I am a quadriplegic 39-year-old, dropped at a sixth grade. All right. People, if you would like, I'll leave. Natalie, please leave a link to... Or DM me on Twitter. I don't think you can leave links here. DM me on Twitter, and I'll leave a link to this person's work in the description. Zikafoos. If the UAP is not government, could it be a private entity? It could be. It, there's so Almost any sentence that you place after, could it be, is yes. It's true. It could be. So I don't know how to answer a question like that. And I also don't know how to answer a question like, do I find it likely? I don't, I don't like questions about probability. I think the way that people use it is more indicative of unconscious beliefs than it is of... Something like Bayesian reasoning. Well, Bayesian reasoning encompasses un unconscious beliefs anyway. Because of priors. Or at Leo 58246593 says, I'm biased. How do you think your audience will react to Leo? That is Leo Gura. This was before the Leo Gura video was posted. Now again, I don't like to think in terms of my audience, quote unquote. For one, they're not watching me. They're not watching for Kurt necessarily. They're watching because they're interested in hearing some perspectives. Perhaps they're watching because they want to build their own toe. So rather than Kurt followers, they're more like toe builders. Additionally, it's not like I'm the host of toe. Like I, I'm, well, I'm the host of toe visually, but the movement of toe that is whatever this is, is, is larger than Kurt. And at some point I'll likely remove my name from the channel because of that. I understand your question though. You're wondering, okay, how will people who regularly view the Toe channel view Leo Gura? I think much in the same way that they view Bernardo Kastrup or Spira, though more on the Spira side. See, it's difficult for me to assess ontological claims that allow for contradictions because, well, the way that my mind works is that you validate something usually by proof or invalidate via proof by contradiction. And then when you're not allowed that, when someone says, well, contradictions are allowed, then firstly, anything that I say could be true and untrue simultaneously. And secondly, then you're left with proof by construction, which is a terribly difficult act. Terribly, terribly difficult. Hmm. PBR Street Gang says, Kurt, Jeremy said that craft can go faster than the speed of light, and you didn't challenge him? Why didn't you? So, again, my, I'm not there to challenge. I also, like I mentioned before, sometimes the meaning behind what someone is saying is true. The explication of it is false. So, and thirdly, who knows if we can exceed the speed of light? Sure, that will break causality, but it's not as if we think that the mainstream view in physics is that causality doesn't exist anyway see people like Sean Carroll and there are different models like Stephen Wolfram's where there are different speeds of light or more precisely that one can exceed the speed of light
Mazeal says, man, give yourself a break, in all caps, literally, and at all different levels of analysis, simultaneously, LOL, capitalized. You need, capitalized, that, and deserve that. Being obsessed with productivity is counterproductive. Even God himself had at least a nap or something. Yeah, yes, yeah, yeah. well, firstly, I'm not obsessed with, pro with productivity at all. Well, not at all, but I'm not obsessed with that. And I do need a break. And I am going to take a break. Mm -hmm. And just so you know, for those who are interested, there's two sources that allow me to do this full time. And that is the patrons and the sponsors. And if you'd like to become a patron and donate just to support this endeavor, slash support me, then you can go to patreon.com slash Kurt I'll leave a link to that. It may seem like each dollar, like a dollar donation doesn't help. A dollar donation helps tremendously. Firstly, just, it's a vote of confidence. And, well, I'll leave it at that. Mm. And as for sponsors, there is Algo. So Amjad Hussein is a huge supporter of the podcast, a huge supporter, and has been since almost its inception. I'll leave a link to Amjad's podcast. Amjad has a podcast called Algo about artificial intelligence and consciousness. He has a supply chain AI company. I recommend you at least visit Amjad's channel. By subscribing to his channel, you're actually supporting this podcast since one of his goals is to exceed a certain amount of subscribers that helps him with becoming a thought leader in his space. It helps his company. It helps this because it helps him continue to support me. So if you like, please, and I'll do so right now, I'll search for this, go to here and subscribe to Amjad. Chris Leto wants to know, what are your top theories for UAPs? Also, I would love to have you on my show anytime. Email me on my YouTube about page. Thanks either way. Chris, it'd be best if you email me if you don't mind. And I say the same sentiment to you. My email is on the about page. As for my top theories of UAPs, I don't have top theories. I'm such a poor person to interview. And by the way, tomorrow I have three interviews back to back, me being interviewed on Garrett Vandenberg. I also have a podcast on the simulation podcast coming up. I think that's live. That's a UFO podcast. And then I have UTOK, Greg Henrique's Universal Theory of Knowledge podcast. I hope, I hope everyone, I hope that I can get enough sleep tonight so that I can perform well on them. That's what I, I'm worried about. I hope I can get enough sleep. Most of my answers are just going to be, I don't know, I don't know, to you, Chris, and to most of those people tomorrow. Zika Foos 2020 says, on your show, UAP has either been government or aliens, but no discussion of private entity. That's false. Richard Dolan is a huge proponent of a breakaway civilization, which is essentially a private entity. Danger Six says, have you considered that these beings could be the solution to the Fermi paradox? N no, I, no, I haven't. I don't like these Fermi paradoxes or Drake equations and so on, drawing conclusions from them, because there's so many variables with so many unknown, like so many... So much uncertainty and so many variables. Eric Rogers, take it easy doesn't mean relaxing by the fireplace with Hawking's brief history of time. Some of your followers may be curious as to how you end up decompressing and relaxing. See, well, I love to play video games, so I'm very much looking forward to taking some time off and just playing some video games, hanging out with my wife, eating like mad. That's what I, my favorite activity is eating whatever I like with my wife and just sitting in Toronto, walking around, biking. I love that. I'll hopefully get to do some of that over November, December. Thomas Martin, why do you think you're so hard on yourself? So critical of your own work. I don't feel like I'm hard on myself. I may be too easy on myself. Zach Meter says, 
would love to see a video dedicated to how you research toes and your overall process to researching theories of everything. I Maybe one day. It's not terribly interesting. Essentially, I look up what other interviews the person has done. I look up the textbooks. They've written the popular books. I've re I try to read those. I see if I can emulate them in my head. I see what questions arise. I note them down. And I look up the papers if they're academics. And that's pretty much it. I don't think I'm leaving anything out. It's not terribly exciting. Mm -hmm. Locke Cockburn says, Do you think that a theory of everything has to be believed to be valid? Or can it just be sufficient enough for the person psychologically and it doesn't need to involve complicated physics or a social theory? I'm guessing, I'm asking, is it personal? And if so, can it be valid and if not, how can it be validated? Well, if I'm interpreting your question correctly, it may have to be lived in some sense. So, look, we think of the theory of everything as being some statement that is either true and or is true independent of humans, and it may be the, it may be more of a process than a like, this is all huge speculation. It may be a process rather than a fact. What I mean by that is some people think that wouldn't it be boring to find a theory of everything? Wouldn't your channel be done if you found the toe? Well, firstly, like, you, man, it's hubris in me thinking that we can, we can come close to finding a, the actual toe. But I'm still trying to push the ball forward regardless. But let's imagine that there is an end point. It may not be a fact. It may be a process, something like live honorably, or love people, or act sincerely and truthfully. And if it's that, well then, time steps forward progressively, and so that's something that we can always do, and it will always be with us, as long as we're in this temporal domain. It may be a fact like that. This depends on if reductionism is correct. But it may be that all of physics comes from something like that. I don't know what that could possibly mean. I'm just, this is all suppositious. But it could be that the ultimate law is a process. Now, there is some reason to think so, at least biblically, religiously. God has been described as I am what comes into being, like I am a process, I am becoming itself. And God is synonymous with reality in many respects. So it's not so far off. It's not so out there. What if the ultimate answer was be loving and bring joy to others? That's a process. And that has to be lived. Jim Allen wants to know about why didn't I like Rupert Spira's King Lear analogy? I've He says, I've always found this to be a useful analogy, so I want to know what you find problematic about it. So I don't recall exactly what it is that I disliked about it. If I remember it correctly, it was something like Rupert Spira was saying that the actor forgets that they were some... The actor forgets their former identity and, is, and assumes the role. That's called method acting, technically. So it's like we method acted our way here. However, there's an element of repetition and conscious effort for the method actor. One is conscious at first that they're not King Lear and then assumes King Lear's identity. And that doesn't seem to comport with what Rupert is saying in other respects. That is, unlike with King Lear, one has a prior conception prior to hitting the stage. Doug, Tar Nepal. Must there be a theory of everything? I'm not so sure. Well, there mustn't. There doesn't necessarily have to be. It seems like there are regularities as far as we can tell. We call them the laws of physics. They describe the universe more and more and more with each passing decade. And it's unclear if it approaches some limit. David Ortega says... When you say comparing any two items, there's manifold ways in which they're similar and dissimilar. Can you better explain that? I really like the podcast. Thank you, David. What I mean is that you can endlessly enumerate the properties of, let's say, this cup. And you can also create new properties. So what's the difference between this cup and another cup that's on my table? Well, they have different volumes, but they have the same color. They were both drank from by so-and-so person, so that's a commonality. But they did not touch the mouth of so-and-so other person. 
they were made within one year of one another. That's a commonality. It's also a difference if you want to get more refined and say one was made on October 27th and another was made on August 3rd. You can keep listing properties and find similarities and dissimilarities. That's another reason why any political discourse for me is so vastly complicated because most of the time people will say, look at what's happened in the past and that's what's going to happen in the future. So let's say, look at what's happened under capitalistic Germany or fascist Germany or communist China and so on or communist Russia and so on. Firstly, then you would have to say whether or not it is capitalism or it is socialism and there are many properties there. It's not as if there's agreement on what constitutes capitalism and socialism and so on, or which countries obey socialism or which countries obey capitalism, then you can always say that, yes, socialism of the past or a country that prom or country that held the banner of socialism had so-and-so a disastrous outcome, but it doesn't apply to now because of these properties that are different. There are always properties that are different and properties that are the same. So one can always make the case that the past doesn't apply to the future. Or it does. These are such complicated issues. People want to say that it's all one side is correct over another. I tend to believe in this quote by Arthur Cain, who said, Only the shallowest of mind believe only the shallowest of minds believe that in great controversy one side is mere folly. Okay, so Matthew Kapozali says, I do a show about theoretical physics exploring free will consciousness and the journey to a theory of everything. Firstly, Matthew, my lawyers are going to contact you. Secondly, given your unparalleled career at the forefront of modern academia, I'm not at the forefront, nor am I in modern academia, and scholarship, albeit mainly in tangential fields, what are some insights you may think are helpful for anyone researching these topics? I would say don't reiterate what you've heard and pretend to know it. Like I mentioned, you'll hear invective against string theory being unfalsifiable, affirmed merely by mathematical beauty, but you don't know that. It takes years to understand what that means. Do you know the Polyakov action? So that's a fundamental equation in string theory. You don't even know that. Or, sorry, not you as, I mean, one doesn't even know that. I'm not trying to accuse you of anything, Matthew. In other words, stop intellectually posturing. It's a form of lying. Stop lying and see how far you'll get. That's my advice, Matthew. Monkey HQ says, I wish I was here. My wish is when you make a Q&A, the first question asked to you will be, how did this channel emerge with such quality that it redefined standards of YouTubers to show the full potential of YouTube? Now, that's a wonderfully complimentary question. It didn't start off, firstly, it doesn't redefine anything. Secondly, it didn't start off with quality. It started off with Better Left Unsaid's interviews that I just posted from my documentary. And those were horrible. Horrible, horrible. Me interjecting constantly, trying to be a thought leader of some sort, if I'm being honest. Egotism, insincerity, and insecurity is how the channel started off. And that's a quality that's only been tempered rather than expurgated. Chris Smith says, question for you, Kurt. When you ask yourself a question, how do you know when you found the answer? When are you satisfied enough to stop searching? Well, firstly, you don't know when you found the answer. You know when you think you found the answer, and that's different. It's like a, it's almost every fact is like a mystery novel. And we've seen like the Thomas Kuhn has a whole book on this paradigms keep changing, recontextualizing what we think of as true and so on. One of the reasons that mystery novels are fascinating is they're expressing this fact to us that we think we know and then we don't know. So for example, you think you found the murder weapon and it turns, so you think you found the gun, it's a murder weapon. It turns out it's a prop in a play. Okay. It turns out then that the person didn't end up dying from a gunshot. They ended up dying from a from a knife wound. And then you find out, oh, actually, what we thought was a knife wound was not inflicted by someone else. The killer was the person. It was suicide. And then you realize, oh, the person wasn't dead at all. They faked it. This happens over and over. I have a word for this. Well, it's not my word, but it's a word that I use. It's called enthymeme. So E-N-T-H-Y-M-E-M-E. -M -M -E. And those are conclusions that we've drawn where the premises or some of them are unstated and almost every single fact is like that there are an incessant proliferation of assumptions that go into almost any conclusion and we don't realize we're making them and they're so so subtle okay getting back to the chat 
There are quite a few questions here. Kurt, what do I think of Nietzsche? I don't know. Nietzsche was contradictory. And you don't have Nietzsche alive to ask him. This I don't particularly like when people make appeal to dead philosophers. For example, with Einstein, people will say, look, Einstein said the block universe, time is illusory. Firstly, Einstein said that once in a letter to console a friend. It wasn't a physics letter. And Einstein was someone who changed his mind many times in his life. You can't ask him, what did you mean by that? Do you mean illusory? In which sense? There are many senses of the word. Affin M says, sorry for such a bland question, but I'm wondering what are your thoughts at this point about the mind-body consciousness problem? So that's not a bland question. There's a whole field, like many papers and fields of science or the cognitive science are predicated on that question. I don't know. I'm still thinking about it. John Griffin. Do you worry that your decision to pro provide a platform for unorthodox subject matter could have a negative impact on a vulnerable, uncritical audience? That can be said about so much. And yes, I worry about it, but not much. I worry more about what not following my intuition and exposing people to ideas that they thought were asinine, let's say, or imbecilic would do to the world. There's so much, almost all of the facts that we think of now were unorthodox that someone would have said have a negative impact on a vulnerable, uncritical audience. Almost every single fact right now that we think of. Riyat Seal says, love the sincerity imbibed in your work. Kurt, definition, rudely brief. Please interview Sadhguru. I've, I've contacted Sadhguru and he is uninterested in being interviewed, or at least his people are. Rat... Riyat, Sa Riyat Sayal asks again. Well, he says, please also investigate E8. I will. I'll talk to Garrett Lisi and Clee Irwin in 2022. Leon wants to know, what do I think of the Buddhist view of the universe? I'm going to be exploring Eastern traditions more in 2022. Alexander Stone, have I spoken with or researched Richard Doty? I think I researched him quite some time ago, briefly, when I was preparing for the Jeremy Corbell interview, the first one. But I I don't remember much about him. Bastion Ray says, Are you a mystical or a physicalist? I think he means I think he means idealist or a physicalist. I think sometimes your contents slash guests are contradictory and extremely confusing, like having Sabine Hassenfelder and Thomas Campbell with totally opposite views. I think most of these contents are more confusing with so many opposing concepts over and over that it seems like the Tower of Babel. Hmm. Right. Well, my question is, why would you want just one type of viewpoint? You can have that. Just read one source. I don't know how one would, how would one determine which view is correct without exploring the alternatives. It would be like, it, like more an extremely mundane example is as if you've only eaten cherries and you think that's the best not only fruit but food there's a contradiction between cherries and apples and hamburgers and macaroni and cheese so why are you exploring macaroni and cheese and cherries well i'm interested in food perhaps they're not opposite perhaps they're combined in some manner perhaps you can't compare them in the same way that you can compare numbers they're okay just so you know in mathematics not everything is comparable there's a whole just partially ordered sets it's something you learn in first year mathematics a partially ordered set can't always compare two elements of a set you have to define an order i understand that it's difficult to follow some of the podcasts because of the wide ranging views but that just means that one needs to put some more effort into it rather than it being a conceptual flaw the channel assumes a level of high effort and trust on those people watching Sicily says, if you had the chance to make a closer-to-truth interview with great thinkers or scientists of the past who have already passed away, who would you pick? Hilary Putnam, Raymond Smullyan, and, and there's someone named, someone I don't know, I never researched, but people keep saying I should research. Ramana Maharshi is someone that I would interview but i don't know so that's just that's just a guess on my part hillary putnam raymond smullyan and romana hmm. hmm okay well i'll do a couple more chat questions and then i should get going kurt iphone or android 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 all the way man 
Samuel Lorenzo says, what do you think of box statement that only a simulation can be conscious? See, I don't, he's saying, yeah, Samuel saying, I don't understand how consciousness arises from feedback loops and self-representation. I don't either. And I also see that as self-consciousness rather than consciousness per se. So Douglas Hofstadter's book is more to me a, a book about self-consciousness rather than consciousness. But obviously Hofstadter and Bach are extremely, extremely bright people. And so that means to me that I'm not understanding their theories correctly. I Jazz Weag says, have I tried to speak to the highly overrated Jordan Peterson? I wouldn't say he's overrated in the least. I mean, it depends on which camp. In many ways, he's underrated by a certain subset of people. Overrated by some, yeah. But I wouldn't say as a whole, he's overrated. And I will speak to him at some point. What maker model is the chair that I'm sitting on? I don't know. I'll look that up. By the way, again, speaking of sponsors, Amjad Hussein. The reason that I'm able to sit in this chair rather than the one that you see in some older videos is because of Amjad. Amjad said, Kurt, what can make your life easier as a podcaster? So I said, firstly, thank you so much, Amjad. And what it would be would be a standing desk. So this is now a standing desk. Some a chair and a couple other pieces of equipment. And Amjad said, I'm going to support you, man. So Amjad, thank you. And you can visit this link, which I will send you again to subscribe to Amjad because subscribing to Amjad is like supporting this podcast. If you can't give a dollar to this podcast or don't want to, for whatever reason, support Amjad because that supports this podcast indirectly. You can subscribe to Amjad at that link. Steven Sturgill wants to know, how can you be conscious without self-consciousness? Well, does a baby have any form of self? Are you willing to torture a baby? That's what I would say to that. TW says, looking forward to watching you tomorrow in the Singularity Lab. Keep up the good, the great work or good work. Thank you. So the chair that I have is called Ergo 3D Ergonomic Office Chair by N-O-U-H-A-U-S. It also has these roller blades for wheels instead of the traditional wheels. So I can move around and it doesn't make noise. TDR says, thanks for getting me through my boring job. Yes, they can help out with that. The podcast certainly have that effect. James Spice, what's your take on, Sas on Sasquatch? Mm, I don't think it's out of the realm of possibilities that it's an actual creature. Jane Goodall, who's a primatologist, thinks that may be the case and that perhaps Sasquatch should be considered a protected species. Steven Sturgill, so I don't understand your question if you say that I reversed it. If you don't mind rewriting it differently, please. Gribulus, Vesters Gribulus, if I'm pronouncing that correctly, says, is solipsism a common trap dead end? Hmm. I think that if you're a solipsist, then you shouldn't believe that your consciousness ends when you die. And the reason is that you have no evidence of other conscious beings ending. Because if you think you're the only conscious being, then anything that you see that potentially dies, quote-unquote, didn't die. They had no consciousness to begin with. You have no evidence that your consciousness ceases. So I would say it's strange to me that a solipsist would ever say that consciousness ends when the physical body dies. They have zero evidence of it. Jack Burden, what video game am I lo most looking forward to? Now, these are the real questions, man. I'm looking forward to Elden Ring. Though the graphics on that are horrible, and no one on the Elden Ring subreddit wants to say that. They start criticizing anyone who says that. And they'll say people don't play games for graphics. Firstly, Bloodborne was wonderful for me, partially because of the graphics. Oh my gosh, when that came out, that is beautiful graphics, Bloodborne. And that increased the, my experience of it. So when people say that graphics don't matter... Well, then you play on a computer that has the ability to increase the graphics and purposefully downgrade the graphics and don't have the concomitant FPS boost. And see, do you like that? No, you actually prefer the graphics to be as great as they can be. Okay, so Elden Ring, either way, no matter what, yes, the gameplay matters most, and I'm very much looking forward to that, regardless of how it looks, I trust from software. I wish that they would remake or remaster Red Dead or release GTA 6, that I would very much be looking forward to. The genres of video games, I like open world games, and I love Fallout games. Favorite movie I covered earlier. 
No, I don't like VR. I've tried it. And Jonathan Blow says that right now it's a gimmick. I tend to agree. PG's asking, have I considered esoteric topics like mediumship? I don't know what that is. I've never heard of that, so I haven't considered it. I am going to be interviewing Dean Radin at some point. Yeah, Magic Turtle interview. You asked me, should I interview Annika Harris? I've reached out to Annika Harris. Haven't heard a reply. And I believe I've done so more than once. There were also a couple questions asked afterward on Twitter, and I'll answer them now. Fakery, at Fakery Official, that is, says, Do you feel art theory improves appreciation of art for you personally, including music, film, painting, culinary, games, etc.? How do you... How did you learn film techniques? So I watched a menagerie of YouTube videos of all sorts, ranging from After Effects tutorials to sound mixing, and then I analyzed them fairly punctiliously with a pen and paper. I took one theory class to its completion, that is, a film theory class, and it showed me what film form was and how one can scrutinize art in a much less subjective manner, disconnected from the story, which is the opposite of what most filmmakers are taught they're taught it's all about the story, and it's not. As for if art improves, or art theory improves my appreciation, the answer is yes for me, as I have a difficult time appreciating what I don't know. If I don't know how something was created, I appreciate it much less. Or, to be more accurate, once I know how something's created, I can appreciate it more. For example, I know how Rock music is created because I was in a band at some point, and so I appreciate rock music, but I can't appreciate modern music to the same degree. I don't know how it is they make the beats that they make. I don't know how they apply the effects. I also don't see why modern songs are in the mainstream credited to the singer rather than the producer, because I see the end result as being 90% the producer rather than the singer. The singer's like the whipped cream. But I also imagine that's much the same phenomenon as people liking the actors or knowing that an actor is in a film and wanting to see a film because of that rather than the writer slash director. When I watch movies, my eyes dart around the screen extremely sporadically, rarely paying attention to the story. Because I know a bit about how movies are created, I'm often thinking about why they made certain choices and not other choices. Steve Piggott at Gorilla Dolphin asks, I'd enjoy hearing you ruminate on what it's like to feel like someone is making sense, but you still don't understand them. There's an amphibological quality to most statements on consciousness and metaphysics in general. Luckily, I'm fine with the ambiguity, and I would say that a skill of mine, if one can call it that, is to be comfortable with ideas that don't cohere. There's an intuition I may feel of connection when someone says something explicitly, then I look at what it means implicitly, unconsciously, and then I see that it's consonant with some established concept of mine. This is all unconscious, so what I'm saying may not be entirely accurate, as it's difficult to know what's going on unconsciously. I'm telling you how I feel, my intimations. And this occurs when someone's speaking. So to me, that's illustrative of them making sense implicitly at one level, but then not explicitly on another level, let's say the surface level. Jeff said, you have a phenomenal vocabulary. Okay, so this is a point of contention for some people. Some people quite like the level of technicality in the videos and some people dislike them. Now, one has to be careful not to use words to sound more intelligent, as it often has the opposite effect. I also feel like some words that are small to other people are in fact large to me or new to me at least, and vice versa. When I'm speaking with someone, I often use it as an exercise. So that is when you go to the gym, you have improper form at first but then you exercise and that's how you build the muscle. When I was about 22 or 20, yeah, when I was about 22, I came to this conclusion that I'm not going to use words that I think that the other person may not know in person. I'm not going to, going to use that when I'm walking and talking with someone because it makes them, it can make someone, and even me, it can make me feel obtuse or inane because it's not fun when you have to ask someone what's the definition of a word. So I made it a policy when I was younger that if it's with text or video or some place where people can pause and not feel publicly decerebrate, let's say, well, then I can say it, for example, in, the, in this form. It's also a bit unfair because when I write alone, I, I write in this manner, in the manner that I speak. When I think, I think with these words. I also feel like words are patons. When I say patons, I take this concept from Douglas Hofstetter. 
words are like cognitive tools. They make your cognition more flexible. One way that you can see this is that if I was to ask you, would you like me to remove 100 of your words at random, you would probably not like that. And the reason is those words help you access other points that you couldn't access before. And the amount that you could express would be so diminished, the amount that you can think would be so diminished as well. Now just take it to the opposite where you want to add words and the more words that you add, it's like adding extra tools to your toolbox. You can do more with them. You can think more rapidly and make connections that you weren't able to before. As soon as you can give a name to a concept, you can all of a sudden use that concept. Whereas before it was 10 concepts, now it's just one. It's also the case that it's going to sound awkward and this is going to be the case for anyone who's trying to Let's say one is trying to lose weight in a group of friends who is who are overweight. You're all overweight. You're going to get made fun of because people don't particularly like when one person is improving in some manner. They'll call you disingenuous and question your motivations. The only way for me to improve my linguistic cognition would be for me to continually use the words. And with repetition comes the facility with them. So, for example, there's a guitar behind me. If you play the F chord, initially it's going to mute most of the strings, but then that's not a reason to not play the F chord. You just have to keep playing it until you get it correct, and then all of a sudden the amount of music that you can create is vast. There are so many myths about vocabulary, like people will say, don't use a $5 word when a $1 one will do, and Feynman was great at speaking simply. Feynman wasn't great at speaking simply. He would speak to a public, to the public simply. But if he's speaking to scientists behind doors, this is from an abstract of one of his papers. The representation of Fermi particles by two component polyspinners satisfying a second order differential equation and the suggestion that in P decay these spinners act without gradient couplings lead to an essentially unique weak for Fermi on coupling. It is equivalent to equ so on and so on. What about that is simple? It sounds extremely verbose. Now, you also have to match your vocabulary to who you're speaking to. For example, when one speaks to a child, one speaks laconically and warmly. And then when one speaks to a 10-year-old, one speaks differently than when one speaks to a 15-year-old and so on and so on. And if I'm speaking to some of the brightest minds on the planet, it's like my mind kicks in gear. That's enough that I'll say about that. The next question comes from Alien Lives Matter. Do you edit your UFO podcasts? And if so, can you place a can you put up a compilation of your edits? Because there may be nuggets. Well, I don't edit any sentiments out of the podcast. Mainly what I remove are my own sprawling pauses. And there may be times where there's an audio or video glitch, and I'll try to edit a few frames around it, but it's never it's never removing what someone was trying to express. Griswold Grimm says, does the YouTube channel, that is the Toe channel, need a showrunner like a sitcom does? Is it like being a captain of a ship for you? So I asked Griswold what he meant, and he said, basically, how many people does it take to run the show? Like, if I was gone, how many people would it take to run? It's just me. I do, I do everything right now. For the Toe Clippings channel, I do outsource that, but the Toe main channel, that's all me from contacting the people directly to speak with them to editing to compiling the questions to the research to the follow-up and so on all of that is currently me even responding to the comments right now is myself and hopefully at some point i can get my wife to take over that as it's becoming a bit overwhelming it's actually more than a bit overwhelming to be quite frank i've just had only an hour or two hours or or so of sleep. I was editing this video and then I got these Twitter comments and so I'm adding these right now. But it's quite it's quite a bit of work and so that's why again I keep mentioning this. I'm very much looking forward to taking some months off. I need to do that for my own mental health. Alright. Well thank you everyone. I should get going. I appreciate that you've been here so long with me. Do I think that we have yet to discover more fundamental forces? Yes. Yeah, Mima type. As for Linda Moulton Howe, yes, I'm interviewing her. I'm interviewing 
Diana Posilka in 2022. Take care, everyone. Thank you. The podcast is now finished. If you'd like to support conversations like this, then do consider going to patreon.com slash C-U-R-T-J-A-I-M-U-N-G-A-L. That is Kurt Jaimungle. It's support from the patrons and from the sponsors that allow me to do this full time. Every dollar helps tremendously. Thank you.